We're highlighting incredible Kansas Cityans who have created lasting legacies in our community. Our own Titans on our final Friday. The spotlight is on a Kansas City style maker with global influence. Nell Donnelly Reed was more than a fashion designer and businesswoman. The Kansas born and raised entrepreneur influenced style around the world for decades. Nell believed in well-made and good quality clothes that women could feel good about whether they were out on the town or washing dishes. In 1916, she experienced her first commercial success as her designs sold to the Gregory B. Peck Dry Goods Company in Kansas City. In 1919, she established the Donnelly Garment Company with husband Paul Donnelly. A size 16, Nell wanted to make sure her clothing fit and flattered women of all sizes. By 1931, with more than 1,000 employees, she provided life insurance, medical care, a pension plan, and college tuition support for her workers. By the early 1950s, the Donnelly Garment Company was the largest manufacturer of women's clothing in the world. Nell retired from the company in 1956 and remained active in the community and various organizations until she passed away in 1991 at the age of 102. She was the preeminent American businesswoman right here in Kansas City. So please welcome Nell Quinlan Donnelly Reed. A be beautiful frock, is it a Nellie Don? Oh, well, yes, it is, of course. But of course. I never went anything but. You were a millionaire before women could vote. The second self-made woman millionaire after Madam C.J. Walker, who was, after all, in the same business, the women's presentation business as well. You were the largest dress manufacturer in the United States and probably the world. How did you do it? And why did you do it? Well, I simply found a niche that needed filling, and I filled it. Um, at the time, turn of the century, of course, uh, women had only two options where clothing in the home was concerned. You could either, when you're working at home, wear these shapeless, unattractive calico uh, Mother Hubbard dresses, we call them. They were 69 cents off the rack, and they just, they looked like a gunny sack hanging off your body. They were awful. You know, you could get a nice dress made, uh, custom made. But that was well, there, there were 800 dressmakers in yes. Kansas City when you started uh, Nell, Nellie Don. How did you compete with these women who were custom making these, these, these pretty clothes? Well, I hired a lot of them. Okay. <laughs> you, you didn't just make functional clothes, you made fashionable clothes. Well, they weren't work clothes. They were clothes that worked for women. They were form-fitting, but they weren't tight. They often had um, pleated skirts and Oh, short sleeves with lots of freedom of movement and always pocket. You need a pocket when you're working at home. I knew the importance of uh, adding extra hemline and uh, waistline and things like adjustable shoulder straps and uh, belt loops and things like that because that way a woman could easily just go snip, snip, snip and suddenly she has a longer waist and she can do her own alterations and she doesn't have to, to pay a seamstress to do that for her. Take us back to Parsons, Kansas, is Parsons, that right? Parsons, Kansas, yes. Uh, I was raised in Parsons, Kansas. I was the fifth daughter, uh, the youngest daughter, in a family of 13 children. 13 children, yes. that's okay. Uh, your mother was very productive. Extremely. You're both your mother and father yes, were immigrants and, uh, from Ireland? He came from County Cork, Ireland, and uh, emigrated here, and uh, met my mother in Illinois, and subsequently uh, moved to Parsons, Kansas, where he worked on the Katy Railroad. Well, my mother and my eldest sister, Mary, taught me to sew. And uh, it was a good thing to know, because as the youngest daughter, I got nothing but hand-me-downs, of course. So they all had to be remade. They all had to be altered and repaired. In a family of 13, hardworking, you're taught to make your, your own way. And you did make your own way. And your own way brought you to Kansas City. At 16. You learned to be a stenographer. Yes, I did. And, and, that, and that led you to a boarding house in Kansas City where you encountered what later you called a modern business romance. Yes, where I encountered Paul Donnelly. Paul Donnelly. Yes, he was also a stenographer at the time, living in the boarding house, and we were married a year later when I was 17. You were 17, 17 and yes. he was 23. Yes. You had ambition. It wasn't enough for you to uh, just be a housewife. You did something really unusual at that point, which you had the support of Paul Donnelly for. You went to? 
I went to Lindenwood College in, in St. Charles. St. Louis. In St. Charles. St. Charles. Yes. Sorry, St. Charles Mo. Yes, yeah. I was the only married student there. It was unheard of at the time for a married student to go board at college, but I, I wanted a higher education. And you went back, and for a few years you were a housewife. Well, yes. But there must have been a moment of, of, of inspiration for you that led to the founding of, of this company and a, a moment of which you created this company. I was a housewife when we first moved back to Kansas City for about seven years, and I did a lot of sewing in that time. And like I said, I absolutely refused to wear those Mother Hubbard dresses. I just hated them. So I made my own, and they were pretty. They were very pretty dresses. And my friends saw them, and, and they said, oh, <laughs> you should try selling those. So who did, you, who did you try to sell them to? I, saw, I tried to sell them to everybody, but there was nobody interested until I got to George C. Peck's dry goods store. Two, two blocks from here, 12th, yeah, 12th, and, 12th and, Main. and Main. Yes, absolutely. Well, Mr. Peck, he wasn't very thrilled about the idea either. He said, nobody in the right mind would buy a $1 dress. And too expensive. I, $1 uh, dress, too yes. expensive. I convinced him, I sweet-talked him into it, and I said it was on my consignment. risk. On consignment, yeah, you, 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 you sweet-talked him into it because you gave it to him on consignment, right? That's right. I said it's, it's my risk, my investment, and uh, he ordered 18 dozen of them to be delivered within two months. I quickly learned that if I put each of us in charge of a certain a part of the construction of each dress, it would go a lot faster. And I continue to use those techniques. Well, sort of like Henry Ford, yeah, it sounds like. exactly. Amazing, right And it's here a good thing, too, River because City. they sold out just like that the first morning. Wow. And World War I happens, and Paul, who is a pretty good business guy, yes. he goes off to war. Hmm. And, and, and he kind of, he kind of, he left you flat or did? It no, no. Now before he left, he secured for me a line of credit that I would need for the business. And he found us some proper factory space in the Coca-Cola building. And he told me before he left, he said, pay your bills on time and don't plunge. He said, go just a step or two slower than you think you can and you'll be safe. Well, obviously you were safe because by the time Paul Donnelly came back from World War I, you had 18 employees. $250,000 in, uh, in sales and no debt. You've built the company, but he's the president and you're the secretary treasurer. Well, yes. <laughs> but but you're, you're the person who's doing this. You're the manufacturing yes, genius. You're the promotional genius. And uh, give us an example of that. How about that incredible invention of yours? The handy dandy apron. It's a very special design. I patented it so no one else can make it. Um, I used it during the Great Depression, after the stock market fell, and it had great big pockets for utensils and... Pockets, and, and, always pockets. Always pockets. Uh, oven mitts and things like that. And it was so pretty, it had lovely lines, you know, you looked lovely while you were cooking. The most important thing, though, is that it was constructed with one single seam. So you never had to, never you never had had to, to lift the, the presser foot. Yeah. Yes, you could go from start to finish of the garment, never lift the presser foot, and we just made a million of them. One. Let's go to 1931. You were making a million five hundred thousand dresses. You've moved from the from the uh, the Coca-Cola building, the Western Auto building, into the Corrigan building, yes. taking taking four floors of that. You've created maybe uh, in one way the first modern boutique in in many department stores we around. We had the Nelly Don shops in just about every department store that sold exclusively Nelly Don fashions. But not everything is quite as bright as it might seem. Because your husband, Paul Donnelly, he was a philandering dipsomaniac. He well, threw, in all he... fairness, the man was a manic depressive as well, so there were chemical issues there. And you wanted a family, but, I did. but yes. he didn't. And he was adamantly opposed to it. He'd have these manic depressive episodes where he would he'd pull a gun out of the desk drawer in the office and threaten his life with it if I ever wow. became How pregnant. What would you do about that? Oh, I simply waited till he left the office and then I pulled the gun out and dropped it down the elevator shaft of the Coca-Cola building. Must have been 30 guns down at the bottom of that thing. <laughs> Start a gangland war. And you've, you've moved to, of course, to a larger house on Oak Street that many, many Kansas Cityans w would know because today it's the Toy and Miniature <laughs> Toy Museum. And miniature museum. Uh, you discover your next door neighbor who is one of Kansas City's uh, greatest figures. Yes. Senator James A. Reed. And Quite how did you get to know Senator Reed? Well, originally I got to know him because he, he litigated a lawsuit that I took against a St. Louis company who was doing knockoffs of my handy-dandy apron. 
The, Senator Reid, uh, part of the, related to the Pendergast machine, very su supported by, by his good friend Tom Pendergast, he, he runs for president at, at one point. Mm, in 1928. 1928. And, and so in, after 1928, not becoming president, he decided to retire uh, and become a, a lawyer again uh, back in, in, uh, in Kansas City. And you became very, very close to him at this point, at the same time that Paul Donnelly, your husband, was going off the tracks. Yes, well, uh, there was one particular night, uh, I recall he threw an ashtray at me across the dinner table. I barely, I barely ducked in time. I think that was when I really knew it, it, our marriage was headed for, <laughs> headed for the hills. But um. Well, I, I, I need to ask you now about a very sensitive subject, and time has passed and mores have changed a little bit, so perhaps we can be frank about this, but can you tell us now the true story about David Quinlan Donnelly Reed? Well, the truth is that I was pregnant uh, with Jim Reed's child. To help Paul save face um, and to protect the business, I went, I left town. I told everyone I was going to Europe to adopt a baby, but I went to Chicago and I gave birth to David on September 10th, 1931, and brought him home. It was, a, it was a different time period, you know. There was a, a certain story you told the world uh, for propriety's sake, and there was an entirely different story going on behind closed doors, and that was true of a great many people. Right. And that's just the way it was. That's what you did. And then only a few months later, December 16th, 1931, a story that made headlines across the United States, you and your chauffeur, George Blair, coming home and you find someone in the blocking your, your driveway. Yes, there was a car uh, blocking the gate to where we would ordinarily drive in, and there were men uh, outside with the hood up looking under the car as though they were having car trouble. So George hung his head out the window and, and called it up there, what's wrong? And they said, could you give us a push? And they came over to the car, and then all of a sudden they pulled a gun out, and they forced George onto the floorboards of the, of the front seat of the car, and they, oh. they tied his hands and feet, and they said, don't holler. In the meantime, I'm, I'm in the back fighting for all I'm worth. He, they tried to put a bag over my head at that point, and then there was a, a third one who jumped in and was driving and, and said, hit her in the head, hit her, choke her. They're hitting you and They're choking hitting the, you, trying to put the, the, head, the hood over mouth, you. They hit me in the head, the mouth, I was bleeding, and... Um, but when they found the car later, they, they, they changed cars and they parked the car behind the Plaza Theater. And in the car, they found blood and ropes and, and, and paint Rope chips. with red paint chips on it. Where did they take you? Uh, well, I didn't know at the time, of course. That we just drove west for about an hour. It turns out it was somewhere in Bonner Springs. It was a farmhouse. And um, it was a four rooms. And they kept us tied to these two cots. Filthy cots in the back room. No light. Uh, no light. It was pitch black. And the first night, they made me write this ransom note. They dictated to me. And how much did they they want? Did they asked for they the asked ransom. They asked for seventy-five thousand dollars. They said if if word got out at all in the media that they would blind me and kill George. And they call your lawyer, James Taylor, mm -hmm. and he thinks it's a crank call. Until the next morning, when Paul arrives with the ransom note and he realizes that I have indeed been kidnapped. So he contacts Jim Reed. Jim Reed, who's, who's, his who's down in Jefferson City, and we've already mentioned the fact that Senator Reed is very close to Tom Pendergast and, and the Pendergast machine, and there's, there's this other guy in town uh, who really, it's, it's not clear whether he runs Pendergast or Pendergast runs him, but he's certainly the mob boss of Kansas City. We're talking about Johnny Lazia, and Senator Reed, Jim Reed calls, <laughs> Johnny Lazia. And asked him, you know, what do you know about this? And Lazia says... He said he, he had nothing to do with it, that it was probably just some outside pike or some, you know, yahoos from out of town. Because if you were going to pull something like this in Kansas City, you had to clear it with him or Tom Pendergast. And, and no one had cleared it. So... So he wasn't a happy guy. He was not a happy guy. Well, Jim told him, regardless, you can find out who did it and you can bring her back. And you will do that and within 24 him. hours. Yes. He threatened him. So Johnny Lazi is on board and mm -hmm. he sends out 25 cars, a big black hoodlums. Buicks of hoodlums <laughs> spreading out across Kansas City to look for the bad guys. Oh. 
It must have been oddly comforting for Kansas Cityans to know that professional criminals were handling the situation. But Lazia's men found out, they, they, looking at, the, at this rope that was in the back of the car that they'd left behind at the Plaza Theater, and the paint chips, and somebody remembered that there had been this gas station out in Wyandotte County that had just been repainted red, the same color as these, these paint chips. And so they interviewed the gas station owner who talked about a guy named Victor Bonura, mm -hmm. who was a restaurant owner, and it turned out he'd been hired uh, to, to, to bring Supply some food, food yeah. to this farmhouse. And then he, he drew a map. Um, because he was afraid for his life, obviously. He drew a map to where the farmhouse was and then quickly got out of town. Elazia's men find you. Yes, three o'clock in the morning. They come busting through the doors of the, the farmhouse. They said uh, not to worry, they're here to release me. And, and they, they told George to get up and, and they had us walk out to the car with them. And I thought, oh, this, this is not good. I, this, is, this is it. I, these men were scarier than the ones that were holding me. <laughs> And I thought we were going for the ride, you know, the, the ride. Right. They took you and they, they dropped you at uh, an all-night cafe. You know, they took me just a little ways down the road and they, they dropped us off outside and said, start and, walking. And, they, and that's where we ended up. And Marshall Depew was the name of the guy who actually kidnapped yes. you and he had an alias. His alias was Marshall. Martin Depew, Marshall Deputy was Marshall his alias. Marshall Deputy yes. was his, his alias. Where, where did they, Ethel, Ethel, his Ethel, wife, his had wife. been his, Paul's. Had been our nurse, had been Paul's nurse in our house a year before. That's where And she was tried, but she was acquitted. She said that it was just her, her husband's crazy idea he, he hatched when she was working for us. And so, so they caught these guys, the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the bad guys, and they all go to, go to jail. Paul's not much help in his mysterious uh, illnesses. He was the original intended victim, did you know that? They wanted him, but he was having one of his illnesses he and sick. he was in the so house okay. forever and they got tired of waiting and picked me. And, and, and at this point, you're running the company. You buy Paul out of the company and, and, and divorce him, I something very him. unusual in 1931, but you have an opportunity. Senator Reed's wife, who interestingly enough is much, much, much older than he is. Yes. She dies at the age years. of 88, Laura. And, and so you're free and he's free and you, there, there's, a, there's a dinner party that you, you give for 30 friends or, or so. It was about a year and later, but uh, we waited until uh, everybody had finished their, their meal before dessert came. And um, I asked everybody to stand up and bear witness as a uh, federal judge, John C. Pollock, who was also a guest, married us right there on the spot. A unique, a, a unique dinner, uh, dinner party, and <laughs> surprised everybody. <laughs> here that the senator Except died yes, yes. Uh, in uh, in 1940, 1944. 1944. September 8th. Had had 11 years. Uh, uh, the best 11 years of my life. Best 11 years of your life. 1947. Let's let's look at 1947 for a second. 14 million dollars in sales. The largest dress manufacturer in the world. Mm. And you decide to build? The largest dress manufacturing factory in the world. It was two city blocks wide. It was at uh, 3500 East 17th Street, so a few blocks east of 18th and Vine area now. It had so many innovations. Uh, you even had a railroad hub for bringing fabrics in and then shipping dresses out. It was, it was something. <laughs> it was a marvel. But you, you've reached a certain age, and so you sold the company in, in, in 1956 and kind of changed the, uh, what you did in the world at that point. You became something of a philanthropist. Yes, and... spent a lot of time with family and took part in civic activities that I cared about, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm.